I want to talk about diagnostics because yes. you're known around the world for being one of the best um, to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. Let's just start with um, the APOE4 gene, which is, as we know, named the Alzheimer's gene. How critical is that gene to predicting um, who will get Alzheimer's disease? So as a predictor, the APOE4 gene risk is significant. If you have a double copy, meaning homozygote, your lifetime risk is 91% that you will develop Alzheimer's in your lifetime. If you're a heterozygote, meaning one copy, you have a 40% risk of developing in your lifetime. We know that uh, if you have uh, APOE4 and you have any memory impairment, the probability of Alzheimer's pathology in your brain is somewhere between 94 and 97 percent. We also know that uh, people, people with mild cognitive impairment progress to full dementia three times as fast with APOE4, than, or three times as likely, I should say, than people who do not have the APOE4. So it is a huge risk factor, and we call it a susceptibility gene. It's not really true positive, negative, you get it, you don't get it. It's what we call a susceptibility gene. So when you are diagnosing, um, how, how critical is it to know understand genetic profile? It is important to know genetic profile, but I also want you to know, Deborah, it's very controversial. I am one of the few practitioners in the country that draws it, uh, but most people in my field feel like it's not we're not quite ready, even though the studies suggest that people, you can disclose this information safely and then use it in a responsible manner without un, uh, unexpected consequences. So I can say to you that the use of the APOE genotype should and could become part of the, uh, the, the clinical landscape, but it just hasn't done so yet. So why do you use it specifically? Because of some of the things I told you, I find it's highly predictive. I like to use it in the framework of the why. Why did you get it? I only select patients to get it. So people with mild cognitive impairment or early Alzheimer's dementia, people if they're severe, I probably don't order it. If they're 90 years old, I don't order it. But in young, younger people, anywhere some say 55 to 90, it helps me to explain why. So if you were born with, if you have an APOE4, you had a genetic risk your entire life. So I say, you know, here's your risk. And you know, the statistics suggest that 60% of people actually have the APOE4 in Alzheimer's, but this, the general population is only 20%. So it is a very rich predictor of future progression and is a, it aids in the diagnostic in terms of the confidence of the diagnosis. In terms of diagnostics though, how does that help you um, in terms of assessing um, even like risk and treatment for the patient? So it, it's really in paramount. American neurology is, despite the availability of biomarkers, is not really evolved to where it needs to be. The way you were taught, the way I was taught, is that you can only diagnose Alzheimer's disease with an autopsy. Where does that come from? It comes from the 1984 ADRDA criteria, which says Alzheimer's dementia autopsy confirmed for definite, probable means progressive, but not any other cause. The reality is, is that Alzheimer's as a clinical diagnosis is only best case scenario 75% accurate. So we're wrong one in four times. That's best case scenario. It's actually probably one in three times if you would take a primary care physician. Despite the fact that 2011, then 2018, they're saying biomarker evidence of uh, uh, is considered informative but not essential. So you do not see use of CSF, PET, APOE, genetics, other markers beyond a B12, a TSH, and an MRI. That is a very antiquated way of doing it, and yet that's still the practice in 2019. It has to change because what we need to do is be able to be confident. Physicians fundamentally do not feel confident at all in making a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and the way we're approaching it is just not uh, reflective of what's of current science. Are people with E4 more at risk of plaques, finding evidence Correct. of plaques in their brain? Yes, so if you are an E4 carrier and you have symptomatic dementia, the probability of having amyloid pathology in your brain is around 97%. If, you, uh, if you're not an E4 carrier, that goes down to 70%. So it is a highly predictive of amyloid pathology. And it's, it's a, it could be a proxy test for amyloid pathology, actually. I mean, there are people who have E4 yeah. who don't end up with Alzheimer's I've disease. I've met some of those people. And they have plaque in their brains. Correct. So why? There are some people that can go on to not get Alzheimer's dementia, we do not know why. 
And so that's what would be important to figure out is what's protecting those people. Uh, because if you have an E4, it's not absolutely probable you're going to get it, just statistically more likely. And there's a lot of people now questioning the whole plaque um, hypotheses. Where are you on that? Yeah, I, I mean, think is that's... it really, should, should um, the plaques be the target for Alzheimer's yeah. treatment and cure? So I tend to look at Alzheimer's uh, pathologically as a biphasic disease, a pre-symptomatic phase and a symptomatic phase. What I know is that by the time you walk into my clinic, you've had changes in your brain for up to 20 years. So the question then becomes, is removing amyloid make any sense? And so far, 10, 15 years into the data, hasn't worked, right? We've tried this lots and lots of times on thousands of patients, and all we conclude, include is that removing amyloid doesn't really help very much. Um, so the question then, is it the wrong target? Is it that we're treating too late? Because of course, these are all in symptomatic patients. So that means they already have a critical mass of disease. Uh, and so what I say to you is that I think the answer is unsettled. I think it is the injury and not the response to the injury and that we're treating too late and that the, the new studies you're seeing now, the A4 study that you are familiar with, this new generation of A4, 5 and other uh, ones will be able to answer that more definitively. Once you have symptomatic Alzheimer's dementia, I'm not sure removing amyloid makes a lot of sense. I think targeting tangles, tau, or other th markers might be, make more sense. So do you believe um, that there are things that we can do today to prevent Alzheimer's disease? So that's a big area. We go to the Alzheimer meetings uh, uh, and you see that for the first time ever at the Alzheimer's Association International Congress in 2019 in Los Angeles, Lifestyle interventions handily were beating drug-targeted interventions for prevention. I was stunned by that. Uh, you know, I, we always say it's gotta be a pill or a drug or an infusion or something. But the lifestyle interventions had very robust signals, very robust data, and drug-targeted interventions not so good. So I say to you the answer is probably yes. And the question, the second question to that is, can you use lifestyle interventions, diet, exercise, things like that, uh, to offset genetic propensity. And I think the answer is it's not settled. I think that Isn't that hope epi so. epigenetics? Epigenetics, is, that is the interface, is the epigenetics. But the, I'm not sure we've settled that it is that we can do that yet. Where do you think we're making the most progress? I mean, there's there's a lot of different areas. There's the pre-diagnostic that you've yeah. talked about. We're yeah. seeing blood tests, things yes. like that come out. Um, there's actually treatment, there's prevention. Um, where do you see the whole trajectory of research? I'm very excited about the fact that we're probably a year or two away from a blood test. Uh, and this would be plasma tau, plasma amyloid. It's an arms race. I mean, people are very, very close, in fact, I know that companies are ready to roll them out in the, in the coming months. But we're gonna use this blood tests, uh, and so I'm very excited about that. But these blood tests are kind of like a man and a PSA, right? So if it's elevated, then you'll do more investigations. If it's normal, then you're done. That's where I think that's a big breakthrough. So, uh, so I think pl blood testing for Alzheimer's, at least as a screening tool, is a major breakthrough coming in the very, very near future. There's ironically only three or four drugs in phase three right now. It's sad. So, you know, on March 21st, when aducanumab announced that they were not, they were pulling the plug on their program, and then a whole bunch of base inhibitors went down, I would have said to you, if we had this conversation six months ago, sitting in this chair, I would have said, oh, we're all about end of 2020 before we have an approval drug. That's now 2023, as early as we can see it. Um, prevention is still a big area, huge area. You're seeing two general uh, approaches. One is the drug targeted interventions. You have the A4, it's just a first gen, but the bottom line is we're gonna start doing that kind of uh, strategy more and more and more. So we're just gonna replace the drug, but the strategy is gonna work. And so I think you're gonna see a whole bunch of prevention trials moving forward in the, near, in the coming years. But the lifestyle interventions, you know, with uh, Mia Kivapelto's uh, finger study and now the US version called the pointer study, we will be able to make practice guideline recommendations. I will look you in the eye and say, based on your genetics, you're this, you're that, these are the targeted lifestyle changes you should make. And that's, um, you know, when you look at the World Health Organization, you look at the American, uh, I mean, the National Academy of Sciences uh, uh, and Engineering and Medicine, they now have said there's sufficient evidence to recommend blood pressure management, cognitive stimulation, and physical exercise. So what I'm saying is that the science of prevention is maturing very well. And I'm still very excited about that.